Maybe, just foes. There we go. Stood so everybody got yeah. silent. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, uh, we're well, live streaming. You know. I think it's working. Is it up now? It's up. Oh, it's up. You're on television. Okay. Okay. Right. Check. You're on Great. Facebook, yeah. Twitter, and Periscope. Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, thank you for making it despite the ice. Um, so, of course, as you guys know, we're here today. Yaron Brook, who is the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute um, and one of the world's leading proponents of objectivism. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, I believe, uh, in finance. Um, but you're not here to hear from me, you're here to hear from Mr. Brooke. So, over to you, Yaron. Thank you. Can you figure out how to... I guess that's Do you want to turn it off? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's in my eye. It's right in my eye. So if there's some way to turn it off, that'd be great. Ah. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We are uh, indeed live streaming on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, something else. YouTube. Um, thank you all for coming on what I know is a, uh, a crazy winter day in London. Uh, uh, I still hate it. I don't know about you guys, but then I now live in Puerto Rico, so uh, this is a little different than uh, where in Puerto Rico. Although we did have a power outage today, and there's no electricity in the whole of Puerto Rico today. So there are downsides to that as well. All right, let me, let me start with a quick question. Um, how many of you, and, and this should be, I think this question, the answer is pretty obvious, but how many of you have read Harry Potter? All right, how, pretty much, oh wow, we've got two who haven't. Uh, so um, uh, J.K. Rowling has a few more bucks to make. Um, so we're talking today about inequality, and I think Harry's, Harry, Harry Potter is really important in the debate about inequality because I, you know, I feel bad because, you know, Harry Potter has really made inequality a lot worse than it used to be, right? Because I don't know about you, but, it, you know, it's made me a lot poorer. I spent, I've spent thousands of dollars, literally thousands of dollars on Harry Potter. I bought, my kids are about Harry's age. So every time a new Harry Potter book came out, I had to buy two copies, right, at midnight, so that they could spend the night not sleeping and reading, reading the books. But then I also wanted uh, to, uh, to follow the story, so I would buy the audio tapes, and we would take road trips and listen to Harry Potter in the car as we would travel around, around the country. So that's three copies of every Harry Potter book. There are seven of them, right, so that's 21 books and now what were they 15 movies or something because they, they they made two movies of every book almost so uh take into account the whole family going to see every single movie uh that came out uh we we luckily for my kids lived not that far from uh, disneyland so there were rides 
And you know, I have added it up. It's well over two thousand dollars of spending on just Harry Potter money that I gave. All right, so uh, we were talking, for those of you who just came in late, we were talking about the fact that I spent about two to $3,000 on J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling became a billionaire. Uh, she became a billionaire, not because obviously I bought, but because everybody bought these books. In other words, we all became poorer and she became richer. And if you follow the inequality debate, this is the point they keep on making. My bank account literally went down by two to three thousand dollars, and her bank account literally went up by two to three thousand dollars times all the people who bought her books. And economists, that's what they measure. They measure how much my bank account went up, down, and how much her bank account went up. But why does it sound weird for me to say I got poorer because I bought Harry Potter's books? Well, does that sound weird? Certainly sounds weird to me. I don't feel poorer. Why don't I feel pure? What did I get in return for the $2,000 that I spent on Harry Potter? What did you guys get from reading Harry Potter in return for the $2,000? Or whatever amount you spent. Hopefully you spent less than that. Nothing? It was fun. It was fun. Very fun. Entertainment. Entertainment. Uh, enjoyment. Fun. Spiritual values. Right? Spiritual values of one form or another. And how much do you think those spiritual values are worth to you if, if you if you contemplate it, right? About the amount of money, at least the amount of money you spent on the books. Because not only did you buy one, you enjoyed it so much that you thought, oh, this is definitely worth the $20 I'm spending to buy a book. I'll buy another one and another one. So your life was better because the spiritual values that you got from Harry Potter were more valuable to you than the amount of money you gave up in order to get the books. So that your actual well-being as a human being improved by spending that money. So J.K. Rollins did become a billionaire, but how did she become a billionaire? By doing what to all of us? By improving our lives. By making us have more fun, more entertainment, spiritually just being you know, happier, being better. But how do you measure that? Well, economists can't do it. Economists have no clue how to measure that. So all economists can tell you is something really bad happened here, according to the economist, right? J.K. Rowling's got rich and we got poor. Because we're told constantly that inequality is this massive problem. Some people get rich, some people are stagnating or getting poorer, and this is expanding and getting the gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and this is a real problem. Well, it's not a problem in the case of Harry Potter and J.K. Rollins, so maybe, maybe it's a problem in other cases, right? Maybe I'm missing something, right? That this gap is getting bigger. Doesn't seem to be a problem in Harry Potter because I got pleasure worth more than $2,000, having two happy boys, worth a lot of money, a lot of money, right? Um, I got much more value than the money I spent on Harry Potter. So I don't mind that she got, became a billionaire. I don't mind that that gap expanded because of the amount of value I received. But I wonder if that works for other things. So let's take the smartphone you all have in your pocket. Hopefully it's an iPhone, at least mine is. Um, this costs probably about $600. You know, when I get back to the States, maybe I'll spend $1,000 on the new X, right? The iPhone X or whatever. Why? Why did I spend $600 on this? Why does anybody? Yeah. It's Just yell out answers. Don't bother. Uh, uh. It's worth more to you than the money. Yeah, because it's worth more to me than the $600. Indeed, if I really think about what this thing is worth to me, it's worth tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, I can't imagine life without it. What would I do business-wise? 
How would I have found this place, right? Without maps on the phone? I mean, I would have had to take one of those big maps out that, just the inconvenience, <coughs> right? In the snow, of course, right? Um, I mean, I can, I can FaceTime, I can video conference with my kids while I travel around the world on this thing. I can stay in touch with colleagues and family and everybody. I mean, how do you measure how much that is worth? Well, it's worth a lot more than $600. And yet, again, when economists look at it, what do they see? They see $600 leaving my pocket and Apple getting richer and Apple shareholders may be getting richer. And the gap between middle class and the rich expanding. And this is somehow a problem. It's not a problem for me. It's not a problem for any of you. It's not a problem for anybody who consumes an iPhone. Because the fact is that how do you become, how do you become rich? How do you become one of those people who are a problem because they're expanding the inequality gap. How do you become rich? What's the essence of becoming rich? What's the secret to making a billion dollars? Anybody? This is important, right? Create something that people want to buy. Yeah, create something people want to buy. But you know, lots of people create stuff that people want to buy. They don't become billionaires. What do you have to create for people to become, for you to become a billionaire? Lots of people want to buy. You have to create something that lots of people want to buy. Millions of people want to buy. Ideally, hundreds of millions of people want to buy. Like an iPhone, or like a Harry Potter book, or like a Microsoft piece of software. And why is it that hundreds of people want to buy this thing that you have produced? Why are they willing to buy it? Because it'll make their life what? Worse off? Because I've become poorer and more miserable? Yeah, because it's going to make their life better. We don't purchase stuff, at least intentionally, that is actually going to make our lives worse. Right? Yeah, we make mistakes sometimes, but generally we purchase stuff that we think is going to make our life better. So the only way to become a billionaire is to sell people stuff, a product, a value, that they believe will make their lives better, for a price higher than what it cost me to produce the good. There you go, now you can all go become billionaires. It's easy. Who's worse off because somebody became a billionaire? Whose condition got worse? <coughs> Everybody became better. I bought the stuff, my life is better. The person who sold me the stuff, his life is better because he made a profit on it. Apple is profitable. I'm happier, more productive, we're all better off. So producing, creating wealth, achieving great wealth, even astronomical wealth, in a free market where you're not stealing, you're not committing fraud, you're actually dealing honestly with other people in a productive way by creating values benefits everybody in the supply chain, everybody who's exchanging goods throughout is benefit. No. Where, anybody know where this is made? China. Really? Well, China? Yeah. All sorts of places. Very good. I mean, lots of places. I think something I, I, I read somewhere, like 40 different countries. Like every little piece of this thing is made in a different place. Every person who contributed something to this made a profit. Yes, and all of those pieces go to China. And in China, they assemble them all into one piece. And then they ship them to the United States. But the United, oh, wherever they're being sold, right? In the United States, they come up with an idea. The chips are made in Taiwan or in South Korea. I think the screen, I don't know where it's made, right? Every piece of his is made somewhere else. And yet everybody along that supply chain is made a little bit better off through the trade by selling the stuff to the next person and so on. So inequality as a reflection of the fact that some people are making money and some people are consuming and some people are making a lot of money because they're contributing huge amount of value. How is that a problem? How can it be a problem? It seems like everybody is better off. 
And indeed, there is no economic theory. There is no economic empirical study. There is no economic fact that suggests that inequality is a problem. When you see people argue that it's a problem, they're either doing bad economics, which is very prevalent these days, really bad economics, or they're not arguing about economics. And I've, I've done debates on inequality with uh, famous economists, and I've not yet heard, I mean, you can find them on YouTube, I've not yet heard an economic explanation for why inequality is a problem. Because it isn't. So why is it such a big deal? Why is every problem in the world today attributed to inequality? From terrorism, to poverty, to the lack of social mobility, to the stagnation of the middle class, to the stagnation of Western economies, to corruption of the rich. Every single one of these is attributable today, according to the media, and according to some people who think they're economists, to inequality. What's that? They're jealous. I mean, jealousy is part of it, but you're right in a sense that the ultimate cause of all this is not economic, it is some kind of other idea that we have about the way the world should be. We have as a culture a, a, a utopian ideal of equality, even though we all know that pure equality, real, you know, absolute equality is impossible or, or really ugly. We'll get to how ugly it is in a few minutes. We still have a desire for equality. Every time I debate somebody, I ask, I ask them, uh, you know, do, do you want absolute equality? And they'll say, oh, no, no, we don't want absolute equality. We know communism, oh, no, that's bad. So I say, how much, how much equality do you want? How much inequality are you willing to tolerate? Well, I don't know, but there's too much today. Okay, so if we cut it by half, is that enough? Well, we'll have to see when we get there. And I can guarantee you that when we get there, they'll want more equality. And when we get to the new point, they'll want more equality. Because it is a philosophical ideal, maybe not an economic ideal, but a philosophical ideal that is driving this, the ideal of equality. That's what we're striving towards. That's what we're trying to get to. And that shapes our, quote, understanding, because it's not real understanding, it's bogus understanding, of our economic phenomena. We invent economics to justify our desire for equality. Now, we'll get back to the equality. There's more kind of going on here because part of the way to get people to buy into this is to kind of mitigate this idea of wealth creation. So one of the, one of the great... Um, uh, what do you call it? metaphors that people use? What do, what do people use a metaphor for this inequality thing? Well, what, do, what do people use? We, we're dividing up what? So, you know, it's not fair that some people have a bigger piece of the pie, right? We love the pie analogy, right? Society has a pie. It's a big pie. And, you know, if you bring a pizza home or if you bring a pizza to friends and you come in, put the pizza on the, on, on the table, what's the expectation? Everybody gets what? About the same piece, right? The same size piece that's perceived to be kind of fair, right? Because, you know, we're all sharing in this pizza and that's kind of the social, the agreement of when, we, when we're heading together and doing this, right? And the assumption is that there's a social pie, which is all the wealth in society, the UK's wealth. And now, wait a minute, some people are getting a big piece of the pie and some people are getting a little piece of the pie. And it's appealing to those people who are used to the pizza around the family table. Oh, wait a minute, why is, you remember when you were a kid, why is my brother getting a bigger piece of the pie than I'm getting? A, you know, I'm getting, you know that, that it's really an appealing to that jealousy, to that resentment of some people getting more than other people. And there are lots of problems with this pie metaphor, right? Let's start with the fact, right? You've got this pie. So what's a, what's a, what's a problem with the pie? Got this fixed pie here, 
What's the problem with it? It's finite. Yeah, I mean, they're presenting it as finite. This is just a pie. But what do we know about wealth? Is wealth finite? But wealth grows. So this is a growing pie, right? So anytime we divvy it up, it turns out that the actual divvying up of the pie affects how fast it'll grow. So the whole pie metaphor is bogus because it assumes that it's fixed and it actually is growing. But it's much worse than that. Much worse than that. What's, what's a deeper problem with this pie metaphor? Someone makes a pie. Yeah. Is there such a thing as a pie? There is no pie. I mean, there's your pie and your pie and your pie and my pie. And yeah, again, economists like to squish all the pies together because we like to deal with aggregate big numbers, right? GDP, right? What's GDP? Where is GDP? Anybody seen GDP? Right? No, GDP is your effort and my effort and his effort and other people's efforts, millions of people's efforts, each one consuming and producing, and we aggregate it all up and we call it a certain, num a certain thing. But that thing doesn't exist. So every one of us bakes a pie. There is no collective pie. There is no UK wealth. The UK doesn't have any wealth. By the way, where is the UK? I've never seen the UK, right? I can see you guys, and some of you might create wealth, some of you might destroy wealth, some of you might consume wealth. But each one of you has his own pie. And squishing them all up together, which generally creates a mess when you do it with pies. We tried this once. I was on, a, on this TV show, and we went to McDonald's and we bought a bunch of pies. And I bought some pies, and the, and the host of the show bought pies. And then we tried to squish them all together to create a social pie. And, you know, it's messy, right? <laughs> this is true. You can probably see it on YouTube or somewhere. Um, it's a denial of the fact that pies need to be made, baked, that wealth needs to be created, that somebody owns that wealth, that somebody created that wealth. And for you to say, wait a minute, he got too much, well, why? J.K. Rawlings wrote those books. Who am I to say how much he should have as a consequence? I know how much I'm willing to give in exchange for those books. And I know how much you guys are willing to give in exchange for those books, and all of us lives are better off. But by what measure should we say, well, a billion dollars, that's too much. I mean, that's ridiculous. How can anybody? But no, she made the world a better place by much more than a billion dollars. So why can't she keep a billion or two billion or whatever the number is? By what right do I take the pie you baked and say it's too big, I'm going to give it to somebody who hasn't baked it or didn't bake as big of a pie? So part of the fallacy involved in this whole idea of inequality is the idea that wealth is collectivized, that wealth is owned by the collective, by the state, by the group, and that we get to vote or we get to somehow randomly decide who gets what. But it's not. Like everything else in life, we can't collectively eat for one another. We can't collectively think for one another. We can't collectively produce wealth for one another. Wealth, like eating, like thinking, is something we each create for ourselves. And if it's ours, then why are you touching my pie? Now, you know, we... we, we uh, we have this uh, trick that we play in society, right? If I come up to you and I steal your pie, or more realistically, if I come to you with a gun or a knife and I steal your wallet, nobody doubts the fact that that is theft, that that is stealing. But then we can play a kind of a little trick. We can go to all of our neighbors and we can get together and vote to steal that person's wallet, and then it's okay. So somehow, through the mechanism of voting, 
we turn something that is a vice that we all recognize is a vice into something that is okay. How can something be wrong for an individual to do, but okay for a group to do? It strikes me more that morality suggests that if something's wrong for an individual, then it should also be wrong for the group. If it's wrong to take my money to give to that person by force without my consent as an individual, then it has to be wrong to do it as a group. And yet the only way to create equality is to take from those who produce the pie, from those who bake the pie, to take as much as you want from them and to give to those who didn't produce as big of a pie. <coughs> that is the only way to achieve equality, right? And you can see that in every realm of life. Right? I, I often use the basketball example. Some of you have heard this before, right? I'm pretty pissed off that I can't play basketball with LeBron James. You know who LeBron James is? Any basketball in the UK? Eh. I can't play football with um, David Beckham. No, Beckham's like they don't even know who he is. <laughs> He's old. They all, Beckham's old. Right? Ronaldo. Ronaldo. There we go with Ronaldo. I can't play one on one. To, you know, you can't. You don't play football one on one. Basketball, LeBron James. Right. I can't play with LeBron James. I want to be able to play with LeBron James basketball. And I want to have a shot at making one basket. Because right now, you haven't seen me play, but believe me, I'm not going to make a single basket if I'm playing with LeBron James. Everybody know LeBron James? Approximately. Yeah. How do we make me and LeBron equal in basketball? Or at least give me a shot. We don't want absolute equality. That would be too much to ask. But at least giving me a shot at a basket, I mean, that would only be fair that I get a shot at the basket. So how do we make me and LeBron James more equal? You need to cut his legs. Yeah, I cut his legs up. It's <laughs> stunning to me how no matter what the group is, no matter how old they are, the same answer always comes back. Either break his legs, or, you know, the more serious people are about cutting his legs off completely. You know, let's, let's make this absolute. Um, Yes, I mean, my fear is that even if you broke his legs, I'll keep the cutting uh, out of this, even if you broke both of LeBron James's legs, I fear that he would still beat me in basketball, maybe not by not as big of a score. So I would actually have to break one of his arms as well to really make this fit. To make it fit, right? This is what's hysterical, it's funny. How can you make it fair by breaking somebody's legs off or breaking somebody's arms? We, we instinctually know, we know that that's wrong, that can't be right, that can't be just, that can be fair, that can be something you do to another human being. And yet, and yet, it's fine to take half of my income. So I used to live in California. I recently moved. And uh, in California, every year, I would pay 55% of my income to the government, whether to California and the federal. If you combine the two, it was close to 55% with a new tax code under Trump, it would be 55%. So my taxes would have actually gone up under Trump. I fixed that, so I'm, I'm pretty happy. But 55%, 55%, what does money represent? Like the money you own, what does it represent? Time. Time, time, effort, <coughs> thinking. And what is time, effort, and thinking? What is that? Your That's your life. <laughs> That's you. I mean, half your time is being taken away from you by the government, by other people, without your consent. Now, I've always thought of this thought experiment. What would I prefer? Right? To have my legs broken once a year or to give up 55% of my income? I, I actually think I'd prefer the broken legs. <coughs> With that 55% of my income, I could fix the legs. I could buy a nice wheelchair, whatever, right? Time, money represents time. Time is irreplaceable. You have one shot at living. Every moment wasted, every moment taken away from you, every moment stolen from you is a moment you will not get back. What is more important to you, your, your effort, your, your time, your thinking, your creation, your ability, that's what life is about. And yet, 55%, gone. 
And nobody questions it. Nobody cares. But we're stunned by the idea of breaking LeBron James's legs. But take Iran's money? Ha, that's easy. <laughs> so no, I don't accept that there's a difference. I think it's the same thing. And it's both a violence. And both a violence against the innocent, both a violence against the productive, both a violence against those who are particularly good at what they do. Because not everybody pays 55%. The better you are at what you do, the more wealth you create, the more they tax, the more they take away. So the only way to achieve equality is to use violence. The only way to achieve equality is to use violence. And of course, that is true in basketball. That is true in taxes. But that is true in every regime in human history that has attempted to achieve any form of equality. Maybe the most horrific story about this story, it's not a story, it's reality, it's truth. The most horrific occurrence of this happened not that long ago, maybe 40 years ago, when a group of intellectuals who had studied in Paris under some of the best egalitarian philosophers of the time, they took their philosophy very, very seriously. They, they studied with Sartre and Foucault and, and, and all those great French, great in quotes, French philosophers. And they learned that equality was the ideal and we should aspire to create equality in society. And they went back to their home country and they managed to achieve political control. And they had this opportunity to create the ideal society. And they wanted an equal society. So they looked around and they saw, yeah, it's terrible, there's a lot of inequality here. Like some people live in the cities and some people live in the countryside. That's not equal. That's not right. So what do you do? What do you do? How do you, how do you make things equal if some people are living in the city and some people are living in the countryside? You move one to the other. What's that? You move one to the other. You move one to the other. So basically what they did was empty the cities, drove everybody out of the cities into the countryside. Now there was a problem of food, because how do you feed all these people now in the countryside? And people started foraging, so they started picking berries and looking for nuts and maybe doing a little bit of hunting. And it, it immediately became evident that some people were good at this and some people were not. Now that's a massive inequality. Some people can actually get food and some people can't. So what do you do? Well, you, you ban foraging, which they did. And people started starving to death and dying. And you still have inequality even then. Because some people are educated and some people are not. Some people can write, read and write, and some people could not. Some people went to school or even university, and some people did not. Of course, the leaders all went to university in Paris, but that doesn't count, right? Everybody else, was, there was huge inequality. So what did they do? What do you do when people, some people, are, 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 more educated than other people. How do you create equality there? Quickly, because you don't have time. Yeah. Kill them. Yeah, you shoot them. You shoot them. So if you wore glasses, it was a sign that you could probably read or you were educated in some way, and they shot you. If they could show that you went to school in any kind of way, they shot you. If you were a particularly good forager, they shot you. If you're good at anything, they shot you. They killed 40% of their own population. This is not mythology. This is not pretend. This is Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. This is the killing fields of Cambodia. You can go read it up. Even Wikipedia will explain to you why they shot people. I'm not making any of this stuff up. This is the true horror, the true nightmare of equality, of what it means to try to attain equality. These are people who take breaking the legs of LeBron James literally and did it in much worse fashion. We think it's just, you know, theoretical. But no, this is real. And people believe in this stuff. And intellectuals in the West justified their actions for years afterwards because it was for a good cause, the cause of equality. But it's monstrous. Everybody knows it's monstrous. There's one sense, only one sense, in which the term equality politically means anything. It's irrelevant for economics. 
It's relevant for politics in one sense. And that is that we're all born equally free. We should all have equal rights as individuals to live our lives as we see fit, to live as free people, as free individuals. When the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence write all men are created equal, now granted they weren't very consistent with that, all men are created equal, what they meant was all human beings are created equally free, equal rights, equal protections under the law, where the law does not discriminate. The law treats you the same, no matter if you're rich or no matter if you're poor, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your gender, no matter all of these things. That is the ideal to strive for. True equality is equality of rights, equality of freedom. Any attempt, though, to establish equality of outcome of any kind must necessitate the violation of equality before the law, of equality of rights, of equality of freedom. The only way to achieve equality of outcome or to reduce inequality of outcome requires violating people's rights, requires violating people's freedom for the sake of somebody else. So the ultimate choice here is, do we believe in freedom? Do we believe in an individual, individual's right to his own life, liberty, property, pursuit of happiness? Or do we, leave, we believe in equality of outcome? You can't have them both. You can't even believe in a, moving towards more equality without violating the principles of political equality. So I'm an advocate for individualism. I'm an advocate for freedom. I'm an advocate for individual rights. I don't believe one iota of effort or thought or consideration should be given to economic inequality. Thank you all. All right, we have plenty of time for questions. That's right. So, look, I don't believe that anything that is metaphysically impossible can be morally good. There is no such thing as an equal starting point. There's no such thing as equal education. There's no such thing as equal opportunities. These things are all impossibilities metaphysically. And if you, if you view them as something to strive towards, they then become outcomes that necessitate the same kind of actions that any outcome necessitates, which is holding back some people. So if you want equality of education, the best way to do it is to take the best schools in England and shut them down and to put everybody into the worst schools in England. The, best, the only way to achieve equality of education is to go to the lowest common denominator. The only way to do it. And that is unjust. That's monstrous. That is monstrous. Now, when, but, but even if you go before education, look, the fact is, the metaphysical fact is, the fact in reality is we're born with different genes. We're born to different parents. We're born in different decades or different centuries or whatever, right? My kids are going to use technology a lot better than I can, right? That's not fair. Right? But, that, but they were born after me, so they would. So, yeah, we're unequal. We're different. Great. Let's celebrate that. That's a wonderful thing. That's a good thing. And you don't fix a problem by suppressing some people. So I care about education, right? I think it's, education is the, probably the most important product we produce, in a sense, the pro most important service we produce in a society. OK, well, what would make great education? Well, let's look at the best education in England. Where is it? 
it's in the private schools. So why are we giving poor kids crummy education, i.e. government schools, and rich kids get private schools? Why can't everybody get private schools? So let's get rid of the government schools and have private education. And let everybody buy private schools. Now you say, oh my god, poor kids can't afford private schools. Why not? Who said private schools have to be expensive? Since when is quality related to cost in that sense, right? You can have great private education at a cheap cost that anybody could afford. Now, true, you won't be able to play that silly game that they play at Eden. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, it's something, combination between soccer and rugby and something else. What is it? War game or, or something like that, right? So who cares? But all you need in order to get a great, great education is a classroom. Classrooms don't cost that much. And if you really care about private kids, about poor kids getting a private education, then let's all get together and start a foundation that, 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 that gives them scholarships to go to private schools. But, but you shouldn't start with, oh, let's the government provide them. Because then what you're saying is the third class citizens will give them the garbage that the government produces. Because that's exactly what happens. So one of the problems the conservatives often get into is they say, yeah, we're against outcome. We're against equality of outcome. We're for equality of opportunity. But that's exactly the same thing. There's no difference. Opportunity is just an outcome a little before the outcome that they're thinking of, which is equality of wealth or equality. But you cannot achieve any of those. We're, we're, look around the room. I mean, we're all different. We're, we're going to have different outcomes. The, the, the other thing to remember is, and, and this is shocking, right? But life is not about money. So we measure outcome and opportunity in terms of money, but life is not about money, right? Some of us choose to be teachers, knowing that we'll never make a lot of money. Does that make our lives in some way less valuable than somebody who's made a billion dollars? Does that make their billion dollars, you know, promoting more, uh, I don't know, uh, happiness than my being a teacher? I don't think so. I, I think we should, you know, my, my kids, I told my kids, here's my big mistake, right? I told my, my sons, pursue your passion, right? So how much money are they making today? Very close, not quite zero, but very little, right? Because they're both artists, right? Both artists. They're pursuing their passion, they're having a blast, they're having so much fun, right? And they're making a little bit of money because they have to, because otherwise they'd starve, right? But is that bad? That they're poor? No. You know, they chose to be poor because they're pursuing their passion. So the whole idea that we should measure these things, that we should equate people, why don't we equate people over happiness? That would be much more meaningful. But of course, only you can create your own happiness. So the best way for you to, to create your own happiness is to be free. That's the starting point. If you want equal opportunities in that sense, freedom is the equal opportunity. The equal opportunity to do what? To pursue happiness. You're not going to be happy if you're dictated to. You're even not going to be happy if somebody's going to give you a check every month so that you never have to work or you don't have to put bread on the table. Quite the contrary. Struggle to make the money to feed your family is going to create pride and self-esteem that are necessary for happiness that the welfare state demolishes and destroys. So the equal opportunity we need is freedom. And then it's a matter of each individual in his own way, based on his own abilities, based on his own interests, pursues his happiness. Well, what do you consider social inequality? Okay, so, so yeah, so let me say that I think the two things are, are not related. So let me answer that and then you can ask a follow-up. So I don't think the two are related. I don't think income inequality or wealth inequality has anything to do with mobility, and I can tell you what I think has to do with mobility. So how much income or wealth inequality would I tolerate? I don't think it's any of my business to tolerate anything. I don't think it's anybody's, anybody's business. So my answer is whatever, right? What I, the only thing I'm interested in in this political reign is freedom. 
is, is the protection of individual rights and individual freedom to pursue your life as you see fit, to, to, to act, uh, to, to achieve your values as long as you're not using violence against other people, you are free to do so. So the pursuit of rational values, that's all I'm concerned about. Um, so I don't care how big inequality gets or how small it gets if it's based on freedom. That's the only, my only concern. And my concern today is that we don't have freedom. And the same goes with social mobility. Social mobility happens to be heavily correlated with freedom. So in free countries, in free countries you get a lot of social mobility. The more freedom, the more mobility. The less freedom, the less mobility. In my view today, we are constraining mobility with regulations, minimum wage laws, welfare, government controls. They constrain mobility. We are creating a, a class of poor that are in a sense institutionalized into poverty through government fiat. In a free market, nobody is institutionalized into poverty. They, they will rise as high as you know, their capabilities and their hard work will take them. And indeed, if you look back at the 19th century, maybe the freest period for the US at least in terms of economics, what you find is uh, 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 that people would, would, would be, a lot of the mega rich, right, the, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, were poor, had nothing, started out with literally nothing and became very rich. And there was massive social mobility. So if you look at the social register of New York City, you know, the, the rich people in New York, it changed literally from year to year dramatically because not only did poor people become rich, what happened to rich people? They became poor relatively quickly. Fortunes were gained and lost very quickly. There was a saying from short sleeve to short sleeve in, sh in three generations. First generation makes it, the second generation wastes it, and the third generation is already poor. That doesn't happen as much today because we've insulated many of these fortunes from competition. We've created an environment in which people don't rise up and drop because we've taken risk out of society and because we've, we're redistributing wealth all over the place, which doesn't, in the long run, doesn't help anybody. So I am all for whatever mobility there is under freedom. I'm all for whatever there is, inequality there is under freedom. I, people always say, some libertarians say, well, in a free market, inequality shrinks. I'm not convinced. Right? I'm not convinced at all. If Bill Gates had not been guilted into leaving Microsoft, would he be three times richer than he is today? And would Microsoft be a much better company if the antitrust hadn't gone after them and so on? He, you know, inequality might have grown. I don't know what happens to inequality. I don't care. I care about the freedom. Mobility, I'm convinced, and all the empirical evidence suggests, increases with freedom. You had a follow-up? Yeah. Now, if as a consequence of pure freedom, everyone acting within their own self-interest, yeah. uh, the monopoly, let's say, the company managed to form, which owned most of the threat. Now, and then you found that just through pure consequence, the majority of the people weren't able to afford the threat. Would you take issue with that? No, and I think what you would find is that whatever empirical study you're talking about, this would be an outlier because a revolution wouldn't happen. So the causal relationship between bread prices and revolutions is um, secondary, not primary. So I'll give you an example. I don't know of a single revolution to happen in a free country. So yes, in France, in 17, what was it, 90, um, there was a price of bread went up and there was a revolution. Yeah, but there was a king, right? There was no freedom. And I bet you that in the United States today, the price of bread triples. They won't be, or in Britain, price of bread triples in Britain, there won't be a revolution. I mean, we might vote the bastards out, but there won't be a revolution. It won't be quite the same. The same thing is true in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a free country. They can't even vote, right? But if the price of bread went up, I don't think you'd have a revolution because they're essentially economically free. Now, Hong Kong is declining, but... but so I don't think what, you, what you, the empirics show is a causal relationship. It's the price of bread went up because the king granted a monopoly to these bread... So it's, it's authoritarianism creating monopoly, creating a rising price of bread, but it's really the authoritarianism that leads to the revolution, not the price of bread. So it's, it's correlation does not equal causation, and you always have to remember that. Yeah. Um, because we're not always taking risks for our society, kids who don't want to fail have the time to move to jobs and then, um, or any sort of help, corporate institutions, because we're not 
I mean, absolutely not, right? But a tax cut is not helping. A tax cut is just saying you get to keep more of your money. We're stealing, yes, this year. That, that's nice that they're stealing less, but they shouldn't be stealing at all. Um, no, you don't bail out companies, you don't bail out banks, you don't bail out any of these guys. Now, it's complicated with banks only because, right, I believe banks today in the UK, but particularly in the US, are basically public utilities. They are run and, and, and uh, function as arms of the federal government in the United States. So uh, JP Morgan in the US has 200 regulators who go to work at the JP Morgan building in their offices every day. There's not a decision a major bank in the US makes that is not in one way or another signed off by the regulators. So who's running the bank exactly, right? And, and it's no accident that there's kind of a rotating door between Wall Street and, and the Treasury Department in the United States, right? Because they're all, in some sense, it's all one. So given that the government owns the banks, should it bail them out? Yeah. You know, it's such a mess, who knows? But no, generally the principle should be no subsidies, no bailouts, no favors, no regulations that, prote that protect you, but also no regulations that inhibit you. So I would like to see regulations eliminated. I would like to see subsidies gone to zero as quickly as possible. And I would like to see all bailouts stopped immediately. Um, good luck. Well, you, you, I mean, the way you formulated the question, do we have a moral right to help him? Sure, you have a moral right to help him. Do you have a moral obligation yeah. to help him? No, you do not. Now, you can. It doesn't. The fact that you don't have an obligation doesn't mean you can't help him. And indeed, I believe that, and, and this, is, this is true of history, in, in, when you don't have a government-based uh, safety net, what happens is you get charities. And so you might not want to help that particular child. You might be busy. You might be... You might have other things to do, but you might want to contribute to a charity that takes care of children who are abandoned more broadly, and that charity would help this child. So my belief is that the best and only moral type of safety net is a, you know, a voluntarily funded one, which, which is charity. Um, but, I mean, I find it interesting that we always go to these kind of edge cases. I mean, you say that's a weird question, but it's not. It's the question I get every single talk I ever give. Because we are conditioned. We are conditioned by our upbringing. That I can give, it doesn't matter what topic I talk about, right, relating to freedom and capitalism and so on. The first thing that's going to come to your mind, what about the poor? Well, well, not the general poor. What about this little child who's starving? Or what about that little child who's starving? What are we going to do with them? I mean, really, is that the biggest problem we face? Given... Given that under freedom, the amount of wealth that we could create is unimaginable, given that under freedom, you could do whatever you wanted to do with your life. I mean, to some extent, I want to say, who cares about that little kid? I, I don't say that because I do care a little bit, right? But, but in the big picture of things, we would be so far advanced of where we are today. We would be so rich and potentially happy and successful and prospering that those little minor cases are not what should define how we think about the future. I have no question, given how successful and how wealthy we can all become, that we can take care of a few Down syndrome kids who happen to be abandoned. What is there going to be? Five a year, right? How much is it going to cost? I mean, I always ask audience, how many of you are willing to put a little bit of money aside to take care of kids that have been abandoned by their parents? every hand in the room always go up. Well, what's the problem then? We'll take care of them. Okay. How, many, how many people are willing to help me start a foundation to fund education for poor kids in, in, in bad areas? Every hand in the room goes up. I mean, it's, it, it, so let's do it voluntarily. But, but if there's somebody over here said, look, right now I don't have any money because I'm, I'm focusing on my kids or I'm starting a new business or I'm doing this other thing, I can't participate right now. Or, you know, I hate kids, I don't want to do this. Right? There's some people don't like kids. That's fine. Right? Then 
what why do I have to force this person to participate in our little venture? Fine, don't do it. There's plenty of money over here to help these people out. I don't need you, right? But we're so conditioned to think because because of our, our, our upbringing is all of us. Not I'm, I'm not pointing at you. All of us is don't think about you. Right, right. If if somebody gave a lecture like this, the first thing I would think of, wow, I want to live in that society because I my life is going to be so damn good. Right? But no, we can't think that. That would be selfish, and we're conditioned not to think selfishly. We're not supposed to think about yourself. You're not supposed to think about how wonderful your life might be. You got to think about the edge case of somebody who might be worse off. That's kind of the altruistic way of thinking morally, and. You know, I'm against that. Yeah, you, you got to think of that as like a third or fourth thing that you think about. But start with thinking about yourself and how this is going to affect your life. And it's pretty cool. Freedom is good. If, if we could have two more. Well, let's do three. Like, One, Mark, and, and there's two. Oh, four, okay, so we got four. And that's, sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah. So currently in this country, there's a big pension strike going on amongst academics. Thankfully, it hasn't affected LSE. But um, what they're arguing is that they should be, their investment should be protected. Because when they graduated and became academics, they made the decision to go into education, sacrifice their salary, to get uh, a protected, what we call gold plated pension in this country. What would you, what arguments would you make to these academics as to why, I mean, they feel very entitled to, the, to this protection. But what would you, what would you say to them? Why they should be protected? Why they should? I, I, to the market, right? Yeah. So what would I say to academics who are striking because their pensions are going to be yeah, changed from, from being from guaranteed? To, from yeah. Guaranteed, to guaranteed pension to investing in what in America we call four one k or something. So yeah, yeah. from defined, defined benefit to defined right. contribution. That's right. All right. I mean, first thing I would say to them is. They're damn lucky they're not all out in the streets unemployed, given the damage that they're doing to the minds of young Brits. <laughs> so I, I, you know, they should, they should be paying all of us compensation. You, the students, compensation for the damage they're doing you by teaching you. I'm at LSE after all. Keynesian economics, right? LSE. God, haven't you figured out that the guy was wrong, right? right? It's only been, what, you know, 70, 80 years, we, we grow up. So, so that would be my first point. You're not really contributing anything, so what are you, what are you expecting? Look, it, it, at the end of the day, it's a contractual issue. It really is a question, what was the contract? And, it, you know, you can't have a contract for life. So uh, I don't know what they're switching to. Are they switching to part of it is still going to be benefits? So people, and, that people are in it now. They get the oh, then finish. Then there's no argument. In, then, then forget it, right? There, there's no issue, no right? So no contract's even broken. Uh, you know, suck it up. That was what I tell them. And you, you know, defined benefits have been proven everywhere that they use. Not that I'm against defined benefits, right? So defined benefits in the private sector is fine. Uh, it, it, usually, the beneficiary is not very happy with it because what happens? What happens is. It, we're talking about 50 years into the future, the company goes bankrupt and the, the benefits are gone. And they, they, you know, usually managers use those pension funds to keep the company alive for a while and, the, and, and it's never fully funded and it's gone. The thing about public defined benefits, I mean, this is one of the most immoral institutions that exist because what happens when they underfund the pension plans, which is all public pension plans are underfunded, what happens? How do they fill the coffers up? What through happened, taxes. What's happening with this is there's a rule that states that so the top the most funded university yeah. which makes sure we're saying Cambridge is yep. something like yep. we will take we will charge them one percent more each year yeah. if the if the fund is underfunded. So they're gonna take from successful universities yeah. to keep you know, I, I'd rather them do that than just steal it from taxpayers, right? So it's better that they take it from other universities, they're all part of this you know, a disastrous educational plan, um, then to take it from taxpayers who are not involved in, in what's going on in education. So, no, I think, I think defined benefits plans should be banned. 
There should be a law against them in public institutions. I don't think cities should have them. I don't think states should have them. I don't think the federal government should have them because they are fundamentally immoral because in the United States, the way they work is to the extent that they're underfunded. The assumption is, and the reality is, that they expect to get money from the government, which means money from taxpayers. So what happens is that politicians, in order to gain votes, keep increasing the benefits. So you have, these, you have people retiring from, from cities and counties getting six-figure uh, you know, pensions into, for the rest of their lives. And of course, the politician who approved this is not the politician who's going to be alive when this comes, becomes a reality. So, oh, I don't want the firefighters to strike or the police to strike because then I won't get reelected. Say, hey, look, I'll cut you a great deal. I can't increase your salaries right now because I don't have enough money in the budget. But you know what? I'm going to increase your pension. What I'm going to give you is like five times what you got before and don't go on strike. So you don't get money now, but you'll get money in the future. And I'm not going to be in office in the future. So who cares? That's exactly how politicians think. That's exactly what they do. And they do it over and over and over again. So they should never, ever be defined benefits. Politicians should only be allowed to spend money today. They should not be allowed to spend future generations money, which is what they do all the time through, through debts and, and through these promises. So, um, yeah. And the worst part of all this is the whole student body are almost unanimous. Oh, yeah. Well then, you know, but this is, they're the product of their professors, right? So, you know, <laughs> the, 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 this is just more reinforcement to my first, my first day. But on the other hand, I could see a great advantage to having all the professors in the UK strike. You know, that's, <laughs> that's six months or something of, 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 of no bad education going on in the UK. I mean, uh, that's, that's, that's okay. Now, you know, maybe, maybe the engineering and the science guys, we, we give them their pensions, but the rest, Good question. All right. Yep. Uh, so I wonder about the cost you mentioned how companies can idolize the big product, also the general public, uh, bankers and the finance industry, which yes. is really captive. So could you elaborate more on that, how the finance industry is pretty important to society? <laughs> so first, so the question is about the finance industry and, and the value of the finance industry. So first I'll refer you to my talk, where I only talk about the finance industry because it's, it's long and I'm not going to be able to, re, you know, do the whole thing here. It's on YouTube, um, and it's uh, it's called the Mall Case of Finance, I think, and it's uh, both on the Adam Smith Institute's um, YouTube channel and on my personal YouTube channel, which you should all subscribe to. It's uh, your own book uh, on YouTube. Um, <coughs> finance is the industry that makes all other industries possible. There is no computer business without a venture capitalist that funds it. There is no automobile business without a capitalist who provides the capital to, to buy the plant, to buy the equipment, and to pay the workers until the company becomes profitable. I mean, there is no such thing as labor before, without capital. There never in the history of mankind do I know of a case where labor spontaneously arrived in a particular location decided what to make together and went out and made it and, and, and was willing not to be compensated until they made a profit. It doesn't happen. Somebody has to have an idea, the entrepreneur, and somebody has to pay for that idea at least until it becomes profitable, call that the capitalist, call that financial markets. So financial markets are crucial for the existence, the very existence of business, which means the very existence of jobs, which means the very existence of any kind of prospering economy. Now beyond that, you cannot have finance, you cannot have expanding and growing businesses, you cannot have um, growth, any kind of economic growth, without the allocation of capital towards the good businesses and away from bad businesses, the, the identification of what is good and what is bad, what is growing and what is dying, what is the automobile industry versus the bucky industry or the mainframe industry versus the PC industry or the this type of biotech industry versus the next generation of biotech industries. Somebody has to make those decisions. And it's financiers who are making those decisions. The financiers taking risk with their own money on making those kind of decisions. Think about that versus the central planner trying to make those decisions with other people's money, right? And without the competitive pressure and without the ability to fail, which finance fails all the time, part of the process. So 
you cannot have any kind of growing, advanced, sophisticated uh, marketplace, production, wealth creation without finance. So finance is the engine behind it all. So, uh, but it's abstract, right? Any explanation is a very abstract explanation, and most people struggle with abstract explanations. They want a concrete, so I can hide behind a product which is a concrete. We all know the value, or we think we know the value we get from the iPhone, although we never think about it. We know we get a value. Nobody thinks about what makes the iPhone possible, which is an entire financial market, including the ability of Apple to go public and the ability of Apple to raise money in the bond market and the stock market, and, you know, and all the things that went into creating the company that today produces the iPhone. Yeah, Mark. Um, this is more directed for if you're in a millennial generation. I mean, I don't think anyone here is going to complain about J.K. Rowling making money and, and how some of the economists would look at that as, as inequality. But likewise, just if you go to a free society, you have people going up and down the ladder all the time. Yeah. Empirical evidence now, of course, shows that it's much more difficult to move up yeah. than it was, say, even 50 years ago, 70 years ago, and certainly more than 100 years ago. <coughs> You can see the millennial generation generically, and I'm not going to say everybody here, but most part moving further left in protest for that. Yeah. You see it, but what, to me, that's the exact opposite of what they should be doing. Yep. And I'm not necessarily saying you should be moving further right, because the right has plenty of problems yep. as well. But what would you tell the millennial generation to say, direct your anger at? Because it's a legitimate anger. Yeah. No. The direction seems to be wrong. Absolutely. I mean, we've got fewer economic opportunities today, and young people have fewer economic opportunities today, and there's fewer ways in which one can advance and be successful today than there were even 30 years ago, certainly than there were, I think, 100 years ago in terms of what coming, somebody coming out of college or coming out of university, the kind of options they face. And the real question is that needs to be asked and isn't asked is why. First of all, what existed back then that doesn't exist today? And, and what is it about that what exists today is, is constraining those opportunities? And I think the first, if you look historically, the places where you have the most mobility are the places that have the most freedom, where you have the least constraints on the choices that you make, and where you have the most job creation, where you have the most creation of opportunities. So I'm not for equal opportunities to go to that original. I'm for maximizing opportunities. I want to be lots of opportunities for everybody. And they're never going to be equal. But if everybody faces a lot of opportunities, I don't think there's anything to complain about. You, you choose the opportunities that are best suited to you. How do we maximize opportunities? And, and, and to me, it's kind of obvious that you maximize opportunity by maximizing freedom. And whose freedom is most important in the context of maximizing opportunity? It's the freedom of those who create opportunities. And who are those? They're the people who build and create and make stuff or, or, or produce services. It's the entrepreneurs, it's the business leaders, it's the financiers. And then ask the question, are financiers more controlled today, more limited today? And is business more controlled, more regulated, more limited today than they were when they seemingly were more opportunities? The answer is unequivocally yes. We live under much bigger regulatory burden today than ever before it, certainly in America, in the UK, you could argue it was worse in the 60s and 70s, but don't worry, Corbyn is coming to fix that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and you, and you look even in the UK, you look at, at, at what it's, that should do and how did that affect things and did opportunity it increase or did it decrease? Clearly they increased. Well, I wonder what she did to do that. And you go back to the same principle. The more you have a central planner who makes decisions for the marketplace, the fewer, the less creativity, the less innovation, and the less opportunities are created across the spectrum. And I can give you a few examples that relate particularly to poorer people, right? In, in the United States, in California, you need, you need a, a government license to shampoo hair. Like, you have to go, and you have to take a class, and you have to pay like $2,000 to get a license so you can shampoo hair. Really? Now think about who, once as that first step on the ladder of opportunity, of, of, of income. 
to shampoo hair. These are low income people. And now they have to come up with the $2,000 to buy a license. And they have to go to class when they're probably a single mother or something just trying to get by. And yeah, all the opportunity to shut down to her. And maybe she blamed, I don't know, industry or whatever, but the blame is clearly the, the fault of government. To braid hair in some states, you have to have a, a license. To, uh, to open a nail salon, you have to pay like $20,000. I mean, these are immigrants that are trying to make a living. So you could go on and on and on about these kind of examples. And then, of course, what does it cost even Apple to hire an engineer in California? I mean, it's one thing, just the, the amount of money you have to pay the engineers. That's, that's kind of determined by the marketplace. But what about the benefits and, the, and, and all the stuff and the cost of living here in London and everywhere else, which is, which is caused by, again, government controls and government regulations? Why don't you have massive high-rises with condos in London like they do in Miami and in other sane places in the world where the cost of living is not as high as it is here? Is this an access? Is this an architectural choice? No, it's... You know, it's people here in London who don't want skyscrapers next door have voted to limit the height of buildings. So, so guess what? When you don't go up, you're limited in how much space you have. So when you have limited space, lots of demand, what happens to prices? They go up. So that's just one little aspect of it, right? Uh, the, the fact that the real estate in London is owned by people who would like to keep the real estate the way it is because prices only go up. They don't want prices to come down. So you have policies that get, so it's everywhere you look, it's like a, one of these onions, every place you peel it, what you find is what's limiting opportunities, what's making it expensive to live in London and San Francisco and, and places like that is government, is government controls, government regulations, government limitations on our freedoms. And until millennials start exploring that, right, exploring A, where jobs come from, they don't come from government, they come from businesses, and why jobs and why it's so expensive for businesses to create those jobs and why productivity is not rising as fast as it used to rise. And again, think of all the burdens that are placed on businesses in between, uh, uh, you know, as they apply their capital. They need to start asking those questions. And when they start looking, if they're honest, then what they're going to find is government controls, government regulations everywhere that they look. I mean, it's it's. It's in so many different dimensions. It's hard to point to one thing that, it, that, 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 is, that is a cause for all of it. But it's, the fundamental thing is limitations on freedom. The more we limit the freedom of individuals, the fewer opportunities there will be. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi. Um, my question is like about going back to the taxes thing. Yeah. Um, it's, as far as I know, like, there isn't really a country that You can't say that in England. You have to be very careful. <laughs> you, have, you have a bodyguard. <laughs> you have to be careful. This is religion. You're talking about the NHS. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, do you think tax is good for like certain things, or would you abolish the tax system and let the free market go? So in an ideal society, you would abolish the tax system completely. I am against coercion. I am against force. I am against taking from some and giving to others, or taking from some, period. I'm against taking. Force is wrong. Coercion is wrong. And it, again, democracy doesn't make it right because it's for a good cause doesn't make it right. So then you, then you have a, a problem. How do you fund the services the government needs to provide? And only, in my view, government can provide, which, are the, which is the monopoly over the use of retaliatory force. I'm not an anarchist. So I believe that you have to have government that provides those services, and you know, police, military, and judiciary. Now, the first thing to realize, that once we privatize the NHS, once we privatize in America Medicare and Medicaid, once we privatize all the functions of government that are not police, military, and, and the judiciary, the government is a lot smaller. I mean, a lot smaller. We're talking about something that is probably 10% of the current expenditures of government, right? Maybe 15% but you could shrink government by 80 to 90% right? and still have a strong military 
a good police force, and I think a better judiciary, because that's all the government would do. And then the question is, how do you fund that 10%? So I think there are two ways to fund it. One, there's certain things that you can do as fee-for-services. So certain things that the government can charge for, for services that it provides. You, you can't do that, obviously, with, with certain aspects of policing, but there's certain aspects that you can. You know, if you call the police up because you lost your keys and you need somebody to break into your house, you should pay them. Right? That's not something that is, is, is an issue of protecting rights or, or, or where, where it's essential that the police do. Uh, one of the things that Ayn Rand suggests, uh, Ayn Rand writes about exactly this topic in uh, Capitalism, Not an Ideal, there's an, there's an essay on how, do you, how does one <coughs> tax in a free society, how does one raise revenue in a free society. And one of the things she suggests is if the two of us have a contract, and we want that contract to be, to be ultimately arbitrated by the government, that is by a, a, the ju a judge, versus private arbitration or, or whatever. If we want the final authority to be the judiciary system, then we'll, we pay an upfront fee in order to make that happen. You can probably fund the entire judiciary just on that upfront fee, given the size of contracts between commercial entities. Otherwise, we're up to com commercial arbitration, and if one of us doesn't live up to commercial arbitration, tough, right? So it's better that we pay that upfront fee to guarantee um, uh, fulfillment of the contract. Okay, I, this, I think you better stop there. That's okay. I haven't finished the answer. Let me finish the answer, because otherwise, uh, let me finish the answer. So the other way in which you would fund government is by, is by what you, know, you could call voluntary taxation or voluntary generation of revenue. Uh, and I know people kind of laugh at this and think this is ridiculous. That every year you would sit down and write a check to the government to pay for the policing that you receive and the, and the military that you receive. Now, if I had to pay only 10% of my income, because that's about how much the government needed in order to function, I, I would do that without hesitation if they were truly providing that kind of service. And I think everybody would. I don't think that once we reach a society like that, anybody would hesitate to write a check. Now, people say, oh, but what about free writers? I mean, I have two responses to free writers. One is, who cares? I mean, there are always free writers in society, and, and we free write over all kinds of stuff, and I don't really care that much, and I don't think it would be a big problem, not because, because I, I just think people have integrity, and if they're receiving a particular service, they want to pay for it. But if you're really concerned with free writers, how about this? The government publishes every year the list of names of the people who didn't pay taxes, and we take care of them. You know, without violence, without force, we just don't speak to them, we don't serve them in restaurants, we don't allow them in our store, called social, you know, we ostracize them. Coercion light. It's not coercion. Light. It's not a type of coercion. Me not interacting with you is not coercion. Coercion is me interacting with you. That's the essence of coercion, is their interaction. So you can ostracize somebody and, and, and incentivize them to participate, but you know, who knows, by the time we get to that point, we can figure all this out and work out all the kinks. And all. There are a lot of issues much bigger. You know, right now we're paying 55%, or I pay, used to pay 55%. I won't tell you how much I pay today, but 55%, uh, and I'm, you know, let's start cutting it slowly, 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 and when we get to, when we get to a, 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 a course of tax of 10%, let's sit down all together and figure out how to make it voluntary. And, I, and I'm sure we'll come up with something creative, uh, but we're, we're decades away from having that problem. All right, thank you all. Hey.